Okay. So welcome to this episode of the Down the Pub podcast. Uh, we've been trying to get this guy on the show for a while and he's finally gave in. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Alessandro Rigi. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me, man. Excited. Uh, excited for this episode. Yeah, we're, we're really excited too, man. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. And we're uh, joined by the usual suspects, uh, Carlos and Chris. Hi, 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 hi. Hi, Riggy. Hello. It's a pleasure to have you, finally. It's good. These guys, Lorenzo, been that long? These guys are talking Lorenzo like you've been ducking. of the CPL. Hey, a pleasure, man. Good. <laughs> These guys like are that. talking like, like you've been ducking us, man. I don't think you've been ducking yeah. us. <laughs> I, mean, I hope I, I hope I have it. I don't feel like I have. I can I can show I can show you the messages, man, where you're just like telling us to fuck off. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm a superstar. Sorry. I don't go on to these shitty podcasts. I only go no. on ESPN. <laughs> no so, no so, so, so before uh, before we get into everything, um, obviously Ford lost on penalties this week. Um, what what did you think of the game? Uh, to be honest, I didn't see that one. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen every other one besides that one, but uh, very impressed with the squad. And, like, having us having played them and, you know, only, okay, let's say we lost 2-0, but I still consider it a 1-0 game. Like, it was really, really close, and we didn't show up at our best. So to think that that team was, like, doing so well in the Champions League, like, the CONCACAF, like, that was, that was really, really impressive. Man. We were all, like somewhat shocked you know what I mean like they they made it pretty far that was that was really that was a really cool story yeah and like they, they've done like a they've shown the CPL in a great light I mean it's great advertisement for their a league that's two years old for a team to, to go that far uh Chris and Carlos what did you think of the, the game and um poor poor Tristan Henry uh what, what what your heart has to go out to him uh what did you think of that well I'm gonna start by saying that I've been following every here and there the matches of Forge Yesterday, I started to watch it, but I want to be honest with you. I'm not going to bullshit you guys. Um, it was uh, Flamengo versus Racing for Libertadores. And <laughs> I changed it, man. Sorry. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not your team, right? So, you know what I mean? It is what it is, right? But uh, it's just, you know. man, that game was amazing. They went to penalties. Like, we're sorted forged. But um, I, I saw the highlights and, and were, I mean, they're putting the CPL there. Uh, uh, do you think they're going to make a comeback? You guys think so? Um, when they play, is it marathon or something like that? But uh, yeah, marathon. Yeah. Like I mean, like for for Tristan Henry's mistake, the two penalties that they took and that they missed were worse. I thought they were the penalties were dreadful. Uh, what what did you think, yeah, Chris? I, I I agree. I think you know everybody's talking about Henry's mistake, but at the end of the day, they didn't put away their chances. You know, they yeah. shouldn't have ever got to penalties in the first place. So. I actually I watched the whole game from start to finish. I guess I'm the only one here that did. I, I, I watched it, um, but I, I I kind of oh there you go there you go then I, I kind of echo Carlos. It wasn't the most attractive football, um, but I felt Forbes did a good job controlling the game. I could not stand that ref. Um, I felt like he was trying to control the game too much, and there were times where he was not making foul calls where he should have. And, and I found that the majority of those were going in Forge's direction. Forge did have the fair share of the foul calls going their way, but there were a few that were in some vital moments that should have went their way. And it was like the ref was kind of trying to avoid to make the call because he was making so many calls in the first place. So I, uh, I feel for Forge in a weird way because I felt like if, if the ref was kind of, you know, wanting the game to flow, they actually might've, uh, I can't say pulled it off because I guess that was the other team's entire plan was just to kind of hack. And it kind of worked successfully for them because they ended up figuring out in penalties. So, um, but like you think? said, man, Tristan, Tristan Henry is one of the nicest guys in the league. And I, I do feel mm -hmm. for him because it's one of those things where he's full of confidence and you could tell that it was just a, one of those in between two mind mistakes. Yeah, that happens. Um, so for yourself then, uh, Rigi, um, you celebrated your birthday there a couple of days ago. Um, it's been a crazy up and down kind of year for you. Uh, what's been some of your highlights? Definitely, definitely the Island Games. Definitely the Island Games. Oof, I needed that so bad, so bad. It was like <laughs> two years I hadn't played the game, right? So, I mean, having a chance and privilege to play with that group at the Island Games was uh, was really special. Very, very special. Why? Because, first of all, 
it'll be a season that we'll probably never get to experience again, all closed and, and the same ho hotel and stuff. So basically there was nothing normal about the season. But uh, the group of guys we had really, you know, lifted the spirits every single day. It felt natural. It was just, it was just flowing as a team. We all just got along really, really well. And, you know, it's not easy to put a group of 30 guys in, in a hotel for 45 days and expect them to, to get along. But we really, <laughs> really did. So that means the chemistry was, like, on point. Who uh, was your roommate? Alex De Carolis. Oh, nice. The Italian connection. Yeah. yeah. There you the, go. The Italian job. Go. It was actually, if I can <laughs> just, I don't normally do this, Anthony, but it was one of my questions. And since it was just brought up, um, what was it like be living with him during the entire lockdown? I'm pretty sure you guys were together too. So like I had him on my show a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about how living with you and, and interacting with you was a key part in getting through the lockdowns and getting through the Island games. So I guess just kind of give us your angle of that. I oh, mean, I loved Alex, man. Alex was uh, very open, uh, willing to learn. He was easygoing. And it was just, like, such a nice guy, man. Always, every time he's in the kitchen, always asking, like, hey, bro, like, do you want me to cook for you? Like, always going that extra mile for his teammates. And, you know, he really was, uh, like, a true captain uh, and a good example, you know. And, uh, yeah, man, we just we just enjoyed our time a lot together when – my girlfriend came too to live with us. Like he was like super nice and accepting and she was there for a while. And the guy like, you know, he treated her like it was her, uh, you know, his best friend and stuff. So we had like zero, zero issues, always got along, respected each other. And um, yeah, man, it was a good flow. It was, uh, it was actually like really sad when I found out that he was leaving, you know, cause we did, uh, we did the whole year together in, in the, in the apartment but then we also did the island games together so <laughs> you know for me it was like all right i'll like i'll see you next year bro we'll live together and we'll we'll win this whole thing and then that's football you know you go home and unfortunately you won't get to play with him this this next season yeah. but great 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 lad man great great lad honestly we were all kind of sad that he didn't get to come back, man. It's like uh, he, he's definitely been a big part of the club and stuff like that since he signed. And we were all kind of shocked. But as you said, that's unfortunately that's kind of football. Um, so obviously when you scored your, your goal um, and that amazing celebration, uh, it just looked like that the world was just like lifted off your shoulders and you were just like so, so, so happy. Uh, talk us through that. Well, I mean, it was a special one. Why? Because obviously we were trying to clinch uh, the spot for the final four. And we knew if we took care of Ottawa, it was going to release a lot of pressure from the group, right? So, um, yeah, man, we, we were in the game and then we, we scored 1-0. We're, we're up ahead. And then in this, late in the second half, they make a mistake. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm following the play. I'm following the play. And I recognize this mistake very, very quickly. And like, I just pounced on it and it happened so quick that I had no time to think. Everything was literally um, instincts. So I, I saw him make a bad pass back. And so I said, okay, this is mine. And then I, I sprinted to it. And then as I, take the, as I take my first touch with my head up, keeper comes out and instincts just took over. And then when I saw it, like, as soon as I saw it go over the keeper, I knew it was a goal and like that, that feeling as soon as it went in for some reason was exactly like you said, like it was like such a weight off, like the world like just dropped and I got felt like I weighed like two pounds. <laughs> I was ready. I was ready to fly because like you like so much stress and emotion went into like just having the chance to be able to play again, but playing and then providing for your team is like two completely different things, right? It's one thing to be on the pitch, but it's another thing to be able to like assist and score goals. You need to, you need to deserve that. You need to marry that. You need to get there. And, you know, to get my first one back in, in that style, in that game, uh, also not just for me, but what it did for the team, like it was a good, like stress relief for me, but also for the team. We were like, man, like when we got that second goal, we were like, there's no way we're losing this game. Like, this is it. We just, we just clinched our spot. It was just like a huge boost for everyone. Uh, but for me, it was obviously a little extra special because of it. And uh, yeah, I couldn't ask for anything else, anything better really than when the guys all came and, you know, I was just like 
pointing to the sky because I was just like, what is going on? And oh, the guys man. were just there and we, yeah, all the, like in the huddle, we're like, yo, this is it. Let's go. Let's go. We're not losing. Like we did it. We did it. Come on. So it was just like, Oh man, it was just like I want to go back and relive it right now. It was crazy. I thought I thought you wanted to put a Leo Messi, you know, when he does that. Oh yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's only one, Leo, but yeah, did that's you, kind of so, what I did. I mean, so did is it put, true that uh, Mateo gave you the product and that gave you luck scoring that goal that day? Because you were having like the the men bun. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So basically, I bought this gel before the Island Games, right? Yeah, and. Um, Wait, how the hell do you guys know this? That's so funny. So, I'm so yeah. glad you asked this, Carlos, because I heard about this. Please. Yeah, so so, so I, I'm taking my gel, right? Because it's the first time I ever do that, that hairstyle. So I'm like, all right, let's try this out. So I take the gel, and it was this awful gel, dude. Like, nothing was staying back. And I was just, you know, we had to be down in, like, 20 minutes. I'm like, why is this happening right now? I look like a buffoon, literally. So I take my phone. <laughs> I take my phone and I write in our group. I'm like, guys, please, someone give me some gel. Five minutes go by and no one answers. I'm like tripping. I'm sweating. Obviously, everyone's like getting ready, right? We need to be done in like 15 minutes. And then pretty boy Mateo finally, of course, Mateo is going to have it, right? And he, uh, he answers. He's like, yeah, bro, you could come use mine. And then I sprint to his room. I grab him. I, I knock on his door. He comes out. He's like, just finished his shower, just chilling, right? He's like, yo, relax, I got you. And he gives it to me. So then luckily I go back to my room and like, you know, I, I, I put a bit on and obviously his, this guy's hair is always on point. So oh, yeah. it was perfect. And so I just, you know, I applied it and I was like, okay, cool. This is sticking. This is hard. This is like exactly what I need. And luckily it, it worked out. I tied it up and I made it down like two minutes before, you know? So that was good. <laughs> Came from the came from the Amazon or something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Super special gel. <laughs> some some Colombian some Colombian forest is just on one hundred percent. It's giving you the holes, though, so we better start oh, sporting yeah. that thing, you know. I'm, I'm about to buy like a hundred of those. That's for yeah. sure, bro. <laughs> did, did you plan the goal celebration? Was that like a plan, or did that just come naturally? No, you you guys. I mean, hopefully, you'll get to see a lot more, but. I always tend to do like, like every time I score, there's always something really like either it's like really funny or really cool, but it just like, it just always comes out, you know, it's just always instinct, really. Wow. Uh, that one, yeah, that one was, uh, I don't know, That's just amazing. like I ran and I was like, oh, this is it. This is what it is right now. And I just, <laughs> it just came out. So you don't do yeah, a whole, it, you don't it, choreograph it like that, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, you don't, you don't plan them like, yeah, right? No, but it, it, it was cool too because like so we had so much time in the bubble, so um, he was like, "Yo, would you come, come?" Like because we like we like to obviously dance. There's like a few guys who like to dance in the team, and um, and so he's like, "Okay, so look, if I score, Joao's hilarious." Joao's like, "All right, not not if he knows he's gonna score." So he's like, "Guys, when I score, we're gonna go to the camera." And we're gonna do this, and then like he starts teaching me like this dance, and I'm like doing it for an hour, and he's like making fun of me because I'm so bad at it. But then we end up getting like good at it, and then we just like couldn't stop doing it, couldn't stop doing it, and of course he scored, and um, we went straight to the corner and did it. But yeah, no, Joao is completely different. Joao is like, you know, he's already like, okay, like I gotta prepare my celebrations, and he loves it, like he gets really into it. He's very confident because I DM'd him like once before the game. That was when he scored. I said, oh, you're going to score tomorrow. Of course I'm going to will. I score. Of course I will. And then yes. suddenly, boom, he scores. And I'm like, wow, he really kind of like reads the future or something. <laughs> yeah, he is, um, he, he's very, very good for that. Like even, well, he's, it's, it's confidence, you know, because he does it in training. Like he's mm -hmm. uh, naturally good at it, really. So uh, like he, he, he brings it to, uh, to the games, you know. Nice. Put it away there, Chris. I was taking a sip of water, yeah, Jesse that, That's why I said to you to go ahead. <laughs> that was very good. Very smooth. Very smooth. He wanted to chalk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> chalk. Um, so to kind of quote Anthony, quoting my, my very, very good friend, Michael Ian Black, who he's not my good friend at all, but you are your own worst critic. And I've always lived by that. And it's something that it's, it's, it's soccer. You know, if you don't judge and basically relive the game every time you play, you'll never improve. 
So in terms of the Island games, it was your first time playing in two years. You haven't really had a body of work to look back on in ages. How do you feel like you did? I mean, look, as a group, I was, you know, happy until the end, but like, I have to really say it personally for me, um, you know, it was, it was nothing like when I look at my, when I look at my performance, it was nothing spectacular, nothing that I'm used to. There wasn't much flair. You know, I didn't really have the legs to get him behind defenders. I didn't have the legs to like, you know, there was this one, there was this one sequence against Valor where, you know, I'm, I'm, I get a ball from Akeem and the defender comes and it's like a one-on-one -on -one and I chop him, but then I don't have, I didn't have the legs to like get my shot off. Like it was just, for me, it was like, it's, it was tough. It was tough because I know what I can do. And I know that like my body just wasn't capable because of that time frame I had to get ready. Uh, and having to play every three games after not playing for two years and only having six week preparation, which was a very unusual preparation because we were doing it in groups of four at some point. So like because of COVID and all that. So it was, it was a challenge, man. But, you know, my focus was definitely more on, um, I was just there to provide for the guys who were on the pitch because I knew realistically I couldn't be the guy. I couldn't be myself. I couldn't be, you know, someone who sometimes, you know, I, you know, you put your head down and you try and take on two, three players to score. I knew I couldn't do it physically. I had, a, I was, I lost, I had lost a lot of speed and I didn't have time to, to get all these, these things uh, for this, this tournament. So the journey of the Island games for me was really to provide. And, you know, if you look at most of my, my, highlights not really highlights but my my plays was head up always high always looking for Akeem in behind or always looking for Joao to feet or into space or Corey or um or Marshall um it was mostly just feeding every single time so that's I kind of you know put my my mindset on okay so realistically this is where I'm at so how can I help the team win this trophy and so my mindset was always you know, play what you can do right now. So that's, for me, it was, you know, I, I did the best I could. Am I satisfied? Really not, to be honest, like really, really not. But in a way that's exciting as well, because now I'm a, I'm a character who, who uses tough times as motivation. So when I'm home and there's days where, you know, it's boring and it sucks because of COVID and all that, and I don't feel like training. And I tell myself, whoa, you don't feel like training. What you want to, you want to play like you played at the Island games again? No. So, you know, get your butt, you know, wherever you got to do and make sure you're putting the work in so that, you know, you can really give Halifax and, and coach Steven and, and, you know, everyone, our teammates, the, you know, the, the trophy that the city deserves, really. So that's, uh, that's my, you know, that's my answer for me on, on, on my season this year, for sure. So we were just talking kind of, well, you messaged me and I left you hanging. So I shouldn't even, we, we shouldn't be talking about you leaving us hanging because I kind of left no, you hanging. No, I, that's, I that's, hate doing that, bro. I, bad. I, I'm bad with DMs, man. I'm the worst. I should be better with them, but, you know, it's just me. Um, how are you preparing? Because you were talking about living in Montreal right now. All the gyms are starting to close back up and stuff. And it's, it's almost kind of a reset to last March, April, in some cases, for some guys trying to stay fit, trying to stay in match shape because it's such a long off season. So for yourself, this is probably unique because you've played in a regular scheduled season, I'm assuming for your entire career. So uh, how have you been preparing, I suppose? I know it's early, but. Yeah, well, to be honest, I, uh, I only took so far when I came back, I only took about, I think it was like nine days, I took nine days off and most of them were in Halifax because when we got back, Man, it was like, I don't know how to explain this, but it was literally like getting, like coming out of prison because you were stuck in that hotel for so long. We forgot how to interact with people. It was like, okay, are we allowed to go on the streets right now? Like, okay, we can, we can do whatever we want. So when we got back, we all like really needed some time to just chill and go out in Halifax. And I think we went out like seven days in a row, you know, just like to get out, just to relax and unwind and kind of digest the, the loss. Um, and then when I came back to Montreal, maybe three, four days, so not much, maybe let's say 10 days off I took and the rest, it's been, it's been a consistent grind for me. So basically I've said, I know how long I had to be home for, and, you know, I kind of had to like reverse engineer, figure out what I want, how I want to be, 
uh, first practice back in Halifax. And then from there, I've been reverse engineering and taking it step by step. So it's like kind of like uh, one month I'm focusing on this, then two weeks I'm focusing on that and kind of building that puzzle piece by piece so that, you know, when the last day comes that uh, we need to start training, all the, the, the puzzle is complete, the pieces are all put together and I can just start and not look back and forget about all this injury and this and that and, you know, stop using this as an excuse to not perform and just uh, get back to business, really. So to answer your question, I mean, it's, all, it's very different. Like, I haven't started, like, the intense running yet. That's going to come in the last six weeks. So I've been kind of building, you know. Uh, wonderful answer. And before I pass it on to Carlos, I guess this is kind of online with that as well. With your devastating injury career, obviously, it, it's kind of set you back and it can hurt you mentally. And, and we've talked to guys on the show. We've been blessed to speak to guys who have overcome some of the most devastating injuries I've ever seen. And yours was not pretty by any means. So going forward, and I guess you, you've got the Island Games out of the way, so you've got a little bit of match fitness and match experience back. Going forward mentally, what are the tools? What are the, some of the things that you've learned over your recovery that you're going to kind of keep as you try to get back to that level that you know that you can reach? A lot. Uh, this experience really changed me completely as a person. Like if you look at Alessandro Rigi before the injury and Alessandro Rigi today is two completely different people. And that's because I went through a lot of hard times, a lot of hardship, a lot of doubt, a lot of worry, a lot of stress, a lot of unfamiliar territory and not knowing I was a lot of I was very much in the unknown for a long period of time a long period of time and the only way I, to conquer that is really to to train your mind uh, to be able to endure these things right so uh, that's what I did I, I learned to be a lot more patient a lot more dedicated a lot more disciplined a lot smarter uh, it gave me a lot of wisdom it really made me, you know, I was like, okay, I can't physically play the game. So what can I do? I started getting obsessive about studying video on what the high le level players are doing. And so I know what to do when I'm back on the pitch to give me an idea, a visualization of a lot of stuff. So it's basically, you know, if you guys said you've spoken to Alex, the Carolus, I'm sure he's told you a bit of like the amount of work I put in every day. Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, I'm not sure, but it's a very, I'm very much routine based now. And it's very, it's very, it's very demanding. So I make sure to get the grind in every single day because you know, when you add up all these days, it really makes a huge, huge difference at the end. So that's, uh, that's what it is, man. Just using the experience, using basically the character. It, it helped me shape a character to now bring into my future football. I'm not worried about getting back to the level because I have a bunch of time and I'm I, like, yeah. if I can, I can easily say right now, if we started preseason right now, like already it would be a completely different story. So to even think that I have another three months, it's, it makes me feel very calm and very, very, very confident. So I'm not even, you know, I'm not worried. Great. Go yes. ahead, Carlos. Speaking of video, um, you, that now that you mentioned it, do you consider yourself one of those players that before a match start, not only watching the videos that are, um, kind of like play on the technical um, reunions with the, with the team, just on your own time. Are you one of those players that likes to watch the videos of, of the guy that you're going to be, def that defender that is going to be marking you, the opposite, like on your own time? Are you, are you one of those players that you consider yourself? Yes. Yes, I like to uh, not obsess, but I like to look at specific characters. Mm -hmm. So I'll watch... Uh, you know, it depends on the, the, the Allen games was very confusing because there wasn't any previous footage and, you know, it was short amount of games in short period of time, but in a normal setting, uh, you have a whole week to prepare. So you can watch like, you know, one, uh, one to two games or maybe three games in the week, whatever you want. And I like to look at, uh, three, four specific keys really is obviously who I'm facing. Uh, their favorite foot, uh, their like, what's their natural instinct on their first touch? Is it to come like as a fullback? Is it for them to come inside, or is it for them to take it out? A lot of them like uh -huh. to take it out and 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 fake that they're gonna go to the line and come and cut inside. So mm -hmm. I like to just 
I like to understand what's going on in their brain so that I can like play with that. So let's say I know he likes to fake and come inside. Mm -hmm. I'll pretend that I'm, I'm biting to go on the line, but just waiting for him to go inside and then make my move. So I like to, I like to be prepared that way. I think it gives me a lot more confidence. And then I also like to look at the way they defend. So when they're on a 1v1, do they give the guy the inside? Do they give the guy the outside? Are they fast? So like if you push it by them, like is it like a type of Chris Snow where even if you push it by him, man, that guy's going to track so fast, he's going to get the ball back. So maybe you got to figure out something different. You got to make the feet move instead of just the ball. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of things I like to look at so that when I go into a game, I'm not wasting the first 15 minutes on, okay, who is this? How does he play? Mm -hmm. um, what does he like to do? So if you're prepared, you can initially make the difference from the beginning. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's great. Um, would you consider yourself after pursuing, like after your um, career um, finishes, perhaps pursuing a, a managerial career, like being a coach? Maybe, maybe because I enjoyed, you know, being in the life of football very much. I don't really see myself doing mm -hmm. something else. Yeah. Um, but I also, you know, I, I've been, this is not, uh, this is not what I think of myself, but this is what a lot of people have been telling me since I've been like a little mm -hmm. kid is that I'm very good with people yeah. and, you know, being a good coach. Like if I think of Stephen Hart, he's, he's a people guy, you know, he yeah. obviously he knows the game unbelievable, but it's also, it's, it's managing people, managing personas, right? So mm -hmm. you need to learn how to manage a Joao Morelli. You need to learn how to manage an Akeem. You need to learn how to manage a... Um, exactly, but you need to learn how to manage... Um, so I, I, uh, the, our Jamaican boy, superstar, what's his name? I, Alex Marshall. Alex, Alex Marshall. Marshall. Yes, yes. See, that's somebody who came in very, very late. He's a bit timid. How do we make him feel part of the group? And, mm -hmm. you know, Steven's fantastic at that. He made the kid feel so important because he is, obviously. Um, so it's, it's learning how to manage your players and then manage the game. And it's kind of like uh, there's always something to do, which I enjoy very much. So I can maybe... Maybe, maybe see myself do that one day for sure. That's great. One, one last one before I pass it to Anthony. Um, speaking of the Island Games, I saw uh, your, your Instagram stories a, a few times and uh, there's something more like a personal question. Like I noticed that uh, a lot of people, a lot of players were just kind of not complaining, but just kind of like that, that, that the meals weren't great. And then I realized that uh, you always had a special dish. So my question to you is, are you a vegan? I was, um, I was vegan for a long time. I, I still am like, I wouldn't say vegan now, I'd say maybe like mm -hmm. vegetarian because now I incorporated like some eggs in my diet. Protein. And I'll probably, ha yeah, I'll probably have like fish or, yeah, not even fish. Maybe I'll have, let's say, either fish, chicken or meat maybe once every two weeks or maybe once a month, once every three weeks. But mm -hmm. mainly, excuse me, mainly, mainly vegan still. And this was basically on my journey of healing. One of the steps was let's try and change the diet to help accelerate um, blood flow to the body and reduce inflammation and so on and so forth. And, you know, I really became obsessive about every single detail because I really wanted to play again one day. That's and great. luckily that was part of the one of many steps I took to heal. And so I said, well, you know what, if it worked for me, why not just continue? But now that you know I'm 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 back on my feet and things are are much better. I'm I, I'm I lay off a bit, you know. I, I I permit myself to enjoy. Let's say my my mother. We're we're Italian, so can you imagine going home to your Italian parents and telling them, "Hey, I'm, I'm vegan, vegan now." <laughs> They'll be like, "Who is who the hell is this guy?" Get out of this house. <laughs> They'd be saying you're Greek now. You're not Italian. Yeah, exactly. There's something, there's something wrong with this guy. Right here. <laughs> That's good. Go for it, Anthony. Yeah. Um, so as you talked, mentioned there was Stephen being like a man management and stuff for like that. Obviously, he had 17 new players that incorporate into the team this year. So, so what did he do like on the man to man and the group basis to bring you guys all together? Because it looked like you guys have been playing together for ages, not just like a couple of months. I agree. I agree. 
Mm, Steven did a lot, a lot. Now, if I, if I go back to the beginning, we had the, the chance to train for two and a half weeks before shutdown, right? And right away, man, you can see it. <clears throat> Every single day, he would pick at five to six guys. So all, always different guys. So three guys, I would always see three guys before training and then three different guys after training. So, you know, he gets you alone. He makes you feel important. He, he gives you that little, you know, he puts his arm around you for a bit, have two, three laps. And then he always tells you, okay, this is why I brought you here. This is what I expect from you. And this is what you need to be doing better. And, and he just, it's very, very natural for him. Like there's, you can see there's nothing forceful about it at all. Uh, so he was very good on that, on making everybody feel important uh, because of communication. And then from there, uh, he was also good in the collective aspect in training, obviously. And what he did, which I think was very important with the time we had, was after lockdown, <clears throat> what he did, well, he went straight to online coaching. So what he did was, I think it was twice a week, where we had obviously mandatory Zooms. And he would give us homework. So four or five days before the Zoom, he would send the attackers three, four videos, the midfielders three, four videos, the defenders and keepers three, four videos. And so we'd watch them on our free time, prepare, and then we'd have Zoom calls. And it was kind of like school, but it was my favorite school of all time because it was football <laughs> and feel like school. You know what I mean? So he was just like asking us questions. So he's like, okay, attackers, now you tell me, what did you see in the Arsenal video? or, you know, something like that. And then we have to respond one by one and give our opinion and feedback. And he forced us to think a lot. He forced us to go get the answers ourselves instead of, you know, just giving it to us. And, you know, it doesn't sink in the same when you're, you're obviously working to figure something out. And when it's just given to you, it's, you don't appreciate it as, as much. And I think he understands that a lot better than we do, maybe because of his, uh, when I say we, I mean us players, not you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, because I obviously his experience so that was crucial that was very very crucial and again it was always even though we were on lockdown was another way to bring all the guys together uh, which helped us spend more time together uh, so I would say a combination of all those things really really helped you know take all 17 guys and make us feel like we've been a family for four or five years and everything just was flowing man just flowing Amazing. And um, obviously he brought uh, Mazout in as well. Um, what, what did he bring to the, wow. to the squad? Man, we love Mazout. Man, they're, they're, they're like total opposites in character <laughs> and it just works, bro. It works. It's just it's phenomenal. <laughs> Mazout is um, silent. Like you'll never hear him talk unless like he has to. So like Mazout is kind of the guy who is like, if he's saying something, Listen. <laughs> like, listen, but also, like, if he's saying something, it's because it's either happened more than once or it's something that, like, it needs to be corrected right now because he's had enough. Like, this guy is, <laughs> he won't say anything, but it's like, if he says something, it's like, oh, damn, like, yeah, that, that's, you know what I mean? Like, he's not going to let it slide because he wants to win. He's a winner. You can see it. The guy. If you look at his physique and the age he's at, this guy, this guy was training with us. We we were short, you know, because guys couldn't come in because of COVID. Bro, this guy's this guy's a machine. Like <laughs> we would get on the pitch and man, there was a week straight where like <laughs> Joao at one point like was trying to tackle him because we're all frustrated that this guy was getting on the ball, turning <laughs> and like, <laughs> just doing some Paul Skull awesome. nonsense. Yeah, that, the, I, so, not to cut you off, like I'm, when me and Anthony made it out to a training session, that's literally who I said. He's picking well, these pass three right passes yeah. like Paul Scholes. Exactly, like, it man. was wild, man. Wow, Joe Morelli so, did, a, did a two-footer on the assistant manager, huh? <laughs> 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 I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you, you, played with, um, you played with Sean Roy Phillips for a season, I think, when you were at Phoenix uh, Rising. Um, obviously, he's... He was like an amazing winger. Did you learn anything from him? Like just with that one season you had with him? So much. So, so much. Sean is uh, someone very special to me, man. Someone who's still, you know, we, we speak uh, consistently. And, um, man, he, he taught me so much about the game. 
uh, how to be more because we're like you know he's like maybe an inch and a half or an inch taller than me and I mean he's been at the World Cup he's 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 played for Chelsea he's been at the top of the top and you know back in the days I was a lot more like you know insecure and like never really believed in myself to a, like a certain degree and like he would see me and always put me on the spot and kind of like you know shake me and be like come on bro like believe in yourself like I did it I'm the same size and this and that and he helped me a lot he helped me understand different aspects of the game when to be, when to take the ball and dribble when to give it away uh, to help the team what areas of the pitch to play in one touch what areas of the pitch can you play unlimited and express yourself and uh, just how to position myself he was very very big on positioning uh, so many little details so many little details but it was like obsessive for him because he's done it so many times with so many different teams and He's so versatile. Uh, you, you can have him in the middle. You can have him as a 10. You can have him as a winger. And he's also played as a, as a fullback in Chelsea back in the day when they played a five in the back. He was the man running up and down the flank. So he has a lot of experience. And I'm someone who likes to pick at people's brain when I want to, you know, obviously get better. And that guy, I was picking his brain nonstop. And he was super cool because he would always answer. Like sometimes we we'd be out at a club and we'd be like, you know, with the, with the guys and it would be like one in the morning. I'd be like, yo, Sean, I have a question. And he's like, yeah, what's up? And I'm like, and it's like, I'm like, yeah, but it's football related. Are you going to get mad? Cause you're having a good time. He's like, nah, tell me what's up. And I would like, this guy was always like, always thinking football, you know? So he's like, man, he's like a big brother to me. I really, I, I enjoyed so much, like my time so much with him. I miss that guy, man. Seriously respect. He's awesome. Really do you think awesome. he, do you think he left after the year because he was sick of the questions? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote I wrote him an, an apology. Like, Listen, brother, if you want me to if you want me to leave the team so you can stay. I shall do it for you. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> That's such a great answer. You were just talking about picking Sean Wright Phillips's brain, so I definitely have to ask you about picking Mr. Drogba's brain. Um, it's no secret that Phoenix is owned by, I think one of the biggest ownership groups in all of professional sports, but he's the face of the franchise. And from the day he landed in Arizona, he's made it known that he wants to take this thing to the next level. Clearly you were a part of that process. So what was it like working with him on a day-to-day -day basis? That was the most challenging as a footballer. The difference between Sean Wright Phillips and DDA Drogba is their patience. So Sean understands that there's a difference between the level he was playing and the level he was playing at now. Didi just wants results. <laughs> so it's get on the level, get me that ball, I need to score, we need to win. So it's, it's very, very difficult, but it's also like in a way like the most amazing thing for a footballer because you're telling yourself like man like how am I going to get to this level well, like so he he always makes your mind think you know what I mean so he's like he obviously needs to be the end product it's Didi right so he's he's used to you know when he's at Chelsea or Galatasaray he's used to being up there to finish the play right so that's his job is I don't really care what's going on get it up get it out wide exactly get it out wide and then provide me the service and I'll do the rest. Like that's Didi. It's like, you guys do it, just get it in there and I'll do the rest. That's Didi. So, you know, in a way when you're growing up, you're a footballer, you, you kind of want to be that guy, you know, you want to be like the winger who like, you're kind of like, you're trying to be like Didi, like, come on, bro. I'm trying to score goals. And he's like, yeah, you could score when I retire, bro. Don't worry about it. Like get me the ball. You know what I mean? So that, that was that, that was like the difference. So he was, um, he was very, um, very demanding, but also like the best big brother like anyone could ask for. We were all kind of like family for him. It was, he really took us all under his wing. This guy used to bring us to his house, have like team barbecues, cook like so much food. I can't even explain. Always free, never wanted to accept any money from anyone. Uh, just he just loved the team, loved the team bonding. You can see he has a rich, rich culture of football and family, and he just knows how to blend them so well together. 
uh, and he changed a lot when he came. Like we all of a sudden started having breakfast and lunch included every single day. Everything was about, you know, recuperation, being at the top and super, super professional. Bro, I can go on like forever about Didi because he's like the most, like the most elite athlete I've ever been around, really. You could see like, like having getting results has had has had nothing to do with luck with this guy. It's all about repetition. This guy was 38 years old. After every session, would take a bag of balls and he would shoot a minimum of 50 free kicks. Like, come on, like that's like, that's like you know what I mean. Like you've won the Champions League, you've done everything. You come to play in second division in North America, and you're still doing this, like. You, you have to love the game to do that, right? Like, he, he, there, there's no, like, he was not doing this uh, for the fame or anything. This guy was doing it because he just loves, like, like the Ronaldo's, the Messi, like, he loves, you know, making the difference and working hard and that, that self-challenge. He's, he's, he's all about that. He's all about pushing his limits and, you know, get, getting the result. So, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. You said it, like, you hear from everybody who's played alongside him at the highest level. Not saying that you're not at the highest level. I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but they all talk no, about his work ethic. But knowing that you had that day-to-day interaction with him, I had to ask you because I, I, most of the people that are listening to this know that you were played alongside him. But at the same time, he, you were one of his favorite players. He used to talk a lot about you positively. Or is this, uh, is this something that I'm making up off the – off of an end because I remember hearing this a lot back in the day that you were somebody that he really, really admired. He always, uh, he always really respected me. And he always told me that he respected me as a footballer, but also as a, um, as a human being. He, uh, he always, uh, he always told me that. Um, Yeah, man. No, he was, he, I, he, he liked me. The only thing about beauty was really uh, the age I was at, he was, I was like super intimidated by this guy, bro. Like I couldn't be myself. Like I could be myself around Sean. It was easier, but Didi was always like, man, like, can I say this? Like, I didn't really know how to, you know, just like be with him. And, and that's one thing, if I can go back in time, I would just, you know, love to just enjoy that time even more and just be myself more. And cause he's, he's awesome, bro. This guy doesn't judge anyone. Like, He'll love you no matter what, you know, and he'll respect you. And yeah, man. But yeah, he, he did tell me that he, he's respected me a lot and that he actually rates my game and that uh, he always gave me a few things to work on. But he was always like, dude, like you can, you can make a career out of this, bro. Like just keep working, keep working. So yeah, he, he did tell me those words. So before I pass it back to Anthony, you were in Montreal. I, I could be wrong. When it folded, FC Montreal? Am I, not, am I wrong so. by saying that? Yeah. No, so, I was there. Yep, I was there. Yeah. So, so I guess talk about playing for them because it was heartbreaking. The impact is the impact, but FC still had a, a strong foothold in the city, and and you being such a uh, integral part of the team, I guess. Just talk about being part of that team and and how the transition to Phoenix, I guess, happened. It was cool, man. It was really cool because uh, obviously, growing up, my dream was always to hopefully represent Montreal Impact because my parents had season tickets and. It was always something I've just visualized was really being in that stadium, scoring a goal and like just see like the crowd crazy. But then like you just see like, you know, you see like your mom, your dad and your like younger brother just like right there. And I don't know, I've always had that vision to hopefully live that. So that, that just that vision in my brain would like drive me to work so hard every day. And I did that two seasons there with that team. And I finished top goal scorer, top assist both season. MVP, uh, really, you know, I, I got all those awards and uh, I was really sure my, my turn was next. Um, and then for some reason it didn't come, you know, and then they, they, they folded the team. They never really gave me a chance with the first team. And uh, that was a very, very tough period for me. I wasn't sure what was going on, why I wasn't getting any chances. Uh, I had a lot of doubt after that, but then luckily, uh, you know, that was the same time Didi left. And, uh, you know, that's when he obviously, he obviously had mentioned Phoenix and uh, Frank, um, Frank Yellup, who was the first coach back in the day, had messaged me also. And uh, they, they sold the project really, really nicely with 
what they wanted to do and how many years they wanted to get to the MLS and how competitive they wanted to be. They wanted to win trophy, trophies from the beginning and, you know, then bring Sean Wright Phillips, Peter Ramage, Jordan Stewart. These are all guys that played in the BPL and it was a no brainer. And in a way I told myself, you know what, maybe it's the best thing that could have ever happened to me instead of going to MLS at a young age and maybe not playing at all. Uh, and just training, I can go to this team and learn from like five, six players who have played in the EPL and try and win a championship with them. And uh, that was, uh, whew, that was like the best thing that could have happened to me after the heartbreak news of like Montreal just never gave you a chance for the first team. So it was kind of like the perfect rebound. You know what I mean? I said Anthony, but I guess it's Carlos next. I apologize. Go ahead, brother. It's fine. Um, just, just to cut, uh, just one DD question, uh, DD question for you, um, Alessandro. Yes. I think your, uh, your last game with him was against Sacramento. You, you were stopped in the 77 minute. Um, can, can you tell us more of the experience of that? Because that was your last game with DJ Dropa. It must be very special for you. If you can tell us any story about, about that, that, that game specific. Oh, yes. Well, uh, the only thing that comes to mind right now is um, I asked him for his jersey. Wow. Um, yeah, because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how much time we would have had left together. And I was always like a little timid to ask him for some weird reason. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. I don't kind of want to be like a fanboy within the team. I kind of wanted to respect him as a teammate. But anyways, I couldn't hold back. And it was like, I knew that that was, you know, because then I got injured and all that. So I knew that that was uh, the last one. And, you know, he was like not in the best mood because the result didn't go our way. And yeah. whew, he was like a pack of nerves, I remember. And like I went up to him and I was like, you know, like you think I could have your jersey? And they kind of put like a smile on his face. Uh, and he went to the kit man and he's like, uh, where's my jersey? And the guy's like, oh, it's in the washing machine. He's like, stop it, stop it. And he stopped it. He took it out, and like, he, he gave it to me. Nice. Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't wet yet. It, it, the machine hadn't started. It was like right after oh, the game. That's great. And uh, and he's like, "You want me to wash?" I'm like, "Nah, bro. I'm good. Like, I'll wash it at home. There's no problem." And he's like, "Okay, okay." He's like, "Here." And then like I made him sign it and stuff. And yeah, I got to bring it everywhere. I had it with me in Halifax. Oh, well, that's nice. good. They're nice. Where's Where's it now? I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that I don't know where you guys live because I probably go and stole it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. Um, but another question is for you. Like you, you're a guy with a uh, with a good uh, technical feet. Like we all saw you in the Island Games, and we can wait to see you in the Wonder Grounds. Um, my question to you is: From the Montreal Academies, you went to play in Italy, right? And then. I what? I think was that the U19 of, what was the? Sandoria. Sandoria, yes, Sandoria. And also you play a little bit for uh, Celta. Um, Celta so the, Yeah, the Spanish league, it's also known for its midfield, kind of like technical game, you know, it, Italian game is more for Cantenaccio. Um, do you think like these two styles blend you in the player that you, that, that you are currently now? Um, did it have Definitely. any influence? Definitely. In Italy, for me, it was more an evolution tactically. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very, very slow tactical game. Um, but then when I went in Spain, it was more about expressing yourself within, like, with team. So it was all, like, rondo-based warm-ups. It was all possession drill-based drills, obviously, during the session which always ended up finishing in a 5v5 all the time. They're obsessive about it. But what they do is they put touch restrictions. So the beauty of that is now, how do you express that dribbling technicality within one touch, two touch, max three touches? So that's how you learn to play quicker, to think quicker, to take your uh, information before receiving the ball because you know, when I, where I used to play before, I was always automatically better than everyone. So I ne never necessarily took the time to take information because I could get away with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you could, I could, was able to take my first touch, even sometimes only settle it on my second and then do like, <laughs> you can't do that at the top. 
so when i got there it was kind of like okay like you need to you need to learn quick so uh definitely definitely those two things put together uh, with my speed was uh something that helped me a lot in my development yeah and another question for you just before i handle to to anthony um you always play it as a winger um you got um but you're very skillful with your food as i mentioned it before um do you ever consider play behind uh as a classic number 10 um you know yeah, in, so, in any system yeah so uh basically in spain i used to play as a 10 yeah in South I figure, yeah Yeah, so that's where I express myself the most because I'm not just tied to one side. Uh, I can distribute on both, but I could also penetrate from each side. Yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of freedom, which is what I, I, I crave the most when I'm on the pitch. Um, but in Steven's system, we, uh, we don't really have that. Uh, he, yeah. he believes that uh, the number 10 of today's modern game is, is the press. Yeah. So it's, it's not extended. a player, it's a, exactly. So that's why I've had to convert from a 10 to now a winger. Uh, mm -hmm. So for now, for now it's been there. But uh, look, uh, my, my plan right now is to enter preseason in a completely different state. So Steven's going to have a brand new toy to play with. So now he's going to see what he wants to do with this toy and where he wants to put it. So I, I don't really know. I don't really know where I'm going to play this season. I guess time will tell, you know. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Uh, what do we expect for uh, Alessandro Rigi 2021? What's the, what, what does the new Rigi bring in besides improvement from 2020? What, what should we expect from, from this new Alessandro Rigi for 2021? If I could put it in one word, I can promise you guys a lot more flair. Just, you know. Nice. Uh, flair, is the, flair is the key word here. And Not you guys, for everyone. I'm saying, I'm saying it here. Yeah, so... I'm saying it here, so you guys are gonna have to put me on the spot if it doesn't happen within a year. So <laughs> there you go, you got it, Anthony. Remember this. Go for it, my friend. Definitely, I'll definitely remember. Um, just nobody when we finish the show, we just do a couple of like quick fire questions. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask you. Obviously, uh, the great news is that you signed back for for Halifax for next year with a, a club option for the following year. Um, what was the main reason for you uh, coming back? Uh, because of uh, because I loved the experience in 2020. It was very strange because there was nothing normal about it, yet it was one of my favorite experiences in my football career. And that has to do with, uh, obviously, the staff, the fans, uh, you guys behind it, and my teammates. So it was a no-brainer. And the, be the craziest part is I loved it, and everyone, like, Someone like Oxner consistently kept saying, or Peter, Peter was huge on this. He was like, bro, like, you, you think you like this? Like, trust me, you haven't seen anything. Wait until you hear the fans on home uh, game days marching from the pubs, chanting with, with uh, you know, with, uh, how do you say this, uh, the flags. Uh, everyone, like, painted up, dressed up, coming to the games, and then, like, the whole stadium. He's like, it doesn't look big, but when they're in there and they're yelling, like it's, it's like, you know, it's very close to the pitch and we have, we have grass pitch and it's the best pitch in the league. And, you know, you don't have to tell me anymore that I'm, I'm sold. So that was, uh, it probably took around 30 seconds. Amazing. Amazing. So um, just, just for the quick fire questions, uh, if you're going to play in a five side tournament from the players you've played with, who would be on your team? Sorry, can you say that again? Yep, you're going to play in a five-a-side uh, five tournament. From, okay. the okay. from, the pl from the players you've played with, who's on your team? In, in the Wanderers team or all time? All time. Oh, okay. This, so, this, this is going to uh, be interesting. <laughs> so do I need a keeper in this and no? You don't, if you don't want to, you don't have to. No, nah, no keeper. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, Oxner. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be it would be it would be me it would be uh didi drogba up top it would be natural Pia natural piatti on the other side Jesus. it would be uh uh then i'd have to go with um i'd have to go with sean red phillips as like their right back because he can do both he'll come up and he'll he'll defend like a machine and then i'd have to put a um i'd have to put I'd have to put Nesta as a center back. Fuck. Holy shit, man. <laughs> what? Is this, is this, is this is a FIFA 
Yeah. FIFA Dude, 12 or yeah, the <laughs> ultimate, ultimate team. Ultimate team? <laughs> Jeez. Is Jeez. that the best five? <sighs> I, I think so. I, I think Zach Secunda yeah, had, had a lot of these in here because he played for the Montreal Reserve. Exactly. Like but I don't think he actually, I think he played with Drogba in training. And Alex de Carroll has said that that doesn't count. So I think you're t- <laughs> you've actually played with Didier Drogba. So that does count. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, um, what, who was the best, the best dresser and the worst dresser on the team, on that, the Wanderers? Oh, uh, worst would have to be, who's the worst? Uh, I think I'd have to put Corey up there, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, Corey was one of the worst. <laughs> You've been in Cape Breton too uh, long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm for sure, man. Yeah, I mean, some stuff going on. And then uh, the best would probably be like, because he was like super different, was uh, Dan Kinumbe. He nice. had his own. Or uh, James Jaffrard. And... Uh, and um, our Brazilian Joao, for sure. Nice, nice. And then the uh, final question for me is, which do you prefer, Montreal Impact or Montreal FC? Because they're going to change uh, the name, so. Which do I prefer? I'm uh, Montreal Impact. Nice, yeah. nice. Far away there, Chris. So before a game, is there a meal or some sort of snack or something that kind of gets you, uh, I guess, full? So you're not cramping on the field, if you will? Uh, no, not really, actually. I usually like to stick to, like, some pasta. Uh, but I, I eat very, very light before a game. I don't like feeling heavy. Uh, to be honest, I barely need any food on game day. Just, like, the adrenaline alone get, gets me buzzing for, like, a really long time. What What gets me, like, feeling ready to go is just a lot of water or, like, some Gatorade in there, but just water. It just my, helps me feel like fresh. My favorite answer to that was uh, Oliver Minotel's a caffeine pill. <laughs> yeah, I, nowhere to, I didn't expect it whatsoever. <laughs> is there a superstition that gets you in the zone there, Ali? Is there a like, sock before a sock? Like, is there anything that you've done since your youth days that you kept until your senior years? Only music. For me, it's music. It's that's, uh that's perfect. Uh, me that's and Joao are well, sorry, yeah, me and Joao, yeah, me and Joao, like uh we kinda always did this together before every game because we're the exact same. We just need like that like a lo- let loose, like feel free vibe and we would like take care of the music and we would just get a ball and then bring everyone in it, you know. But it would always start with me and Joao and like Peter, let's say. So we just that's like awesome. that music. We need we need to let loose, we need to, you know do like some silly dance moves just to laugh and then just get it going for the whole team. You know, it's kind of like a stress relief for everyone too. That's great. Cause that's my third question is like a pregame song. There's, there's some kind of genre of music that gets you hyped. And I know you're into the opera. There's no kind of dodging that one. Cause we, we heard the rumors and, and, and we also heard that you like to sing along, but we're going to maybe, you know, edit this out, Anthony. Um, no, but for real, like what, what was on the playlist? Because one of the things that was awesome about the Wanderers last year is that they curated a really fun pregame playlist that they played on the system. And I know I can speak on behalf of Anthony and Carlos. Some of those songs are still stuck in my head. So what were some of the, some of the, the artists or genres, I guess, that got you guys hyped this year? Uh, it was, it was too, it was like some like house music, but like deep house music and a lot of uh, Brazilian slash, <laughs> a lot of Brazilian slash uh, Spanish dance songs to it. So it was kind of like a mix of that. We actually had a playlist and I posted after the tournament, I took a screenshot of the playlist and uh, it's called HFX Wonders Pre-Game Playlist. Uh, Peter Schau uh, created it. And that's the one we played. So I'm sure it still exists. If you guys go on Spotify and you look, at, uh, you look for Peter's profile, you'll find the HFX Wonders Pre-Game. Uh, pre- yeah, there you, that's what's up. There you go, man. So you just, we, just, we, we just took James's huge speaker plugged that in and we just shuffled the hell out of that bro and it was just like it was the best vibe ever man that's awesome that's awesome go ahead carlos 
Um, I got, uh, normally I ask one, but I'm gonna ask two. One very quick one. Favorite beard product? Favorite? Beard product. Beard. Oils. Yeah, yeah, your beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to be honest, man, I'm not much of a, um, like a pretty boy guy, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. actually, my, my girlfriend's been getting me into, like, trying to get me into this stuff because I'm very bad at it. Yeah, like yes. the hair and all that nonsense. <laughs> I'm more of, like, that caveman guy where it's kind of like, I don't really, you know, do a lot. But, yeah, I'd have to say oils. Like, if I know I'm going out or, you know, to a restaurant or whatever it is, like, mm -hmm. it's like you put, like, two, three drops and go, go like this and it just makes it look like clean you know no. there you go yeah. the beer tips you know there you go yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but my, my last question is uh, your top three um wingers striker number 10 but your top three in the world could be now could be like in the 90s like your three idols that you say oh yeah these three guys are the guys that i want to emulate in the pitch yeah easy uh maradona messi and ribery for me Wow. Nice. El Diego, man. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> don't, have, don't have Carlos crying again, please, for the love of God. Uh, he's, been, he's been in mourning for two weeks now. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, a week, sorry. Yeah, it kind of sucks. Um, so, on that downer note, thanks, Carlos, for that. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with us, man. It's been, it's been amazing. Um, where, can, where can the fans uh, find you on social media? Uh, so I'm not very, very active, but the most active one is definitely Instagram, uh, a bit of Facebook, not much. And my Instagram, I used to be big on it, but I got logged out of my account and I can't get back in. I tried changing my password and it's been very, very complicated. I'm speaking with Twitter, uh, but on all those three, uh, platforms, uh, but for my, for now, the busiest one is definitely Instagram. Uh, so A L E R I G G I eleven, uh, that's the uh, that's the name. And then you won't you, you can't miss it. It's like I'm uh, the icon picture is uh, me and Halifax gear. So nice, yeah, very easy to find. Awesome. Uh, Carlos uh, DS football, DS football all together in Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And for m my personal account, it's Benny Golas on Instagram. No, in Twitter and Mr. Benitez on Instagram. Chris, and uh, my name is Cyril. It's taken off five episodes deep now. Uh, everybody who's liked, shared, followed, appreciate it. No social medias for it. It's still my personal account, at Christofsky, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-F-S-K-I. And for the, for the podcast, it's uh, Down the Pub Pod. Uh, on, on Instagram, on Twitter, it's at Down the Pub Pod, Down the Pub Pod c1 i think it is on twitter c1. i don't even fucking know to be honest i, I hate twitter um and uh, my, my own personal instagram is at abo 78 um thanks again mr easy for hanging out with us we really, really appreciate it um, and can't wait to see you back here in halifax next season man showing us uh what you can do properly and don't forget we're just going to hold a sign on the side of the pitch that says flare just so you'll never fucking forget. <laughs> Bonus no no pressure, baby, no <laughs> Take care, lads, and uh, until next time. Cheers. Thank you, cheers. Guys, very Take care. Much, man. Thanks, Thank man. You. Cheers. It was a pleasure. Cheers. Ciao, guys. Bye.